Hey everybody, this is Maxine Taylor with another edition of Astrology 201. And this is the last of our series in Astrology 201 where we look at the forecast, at your forecast. And before I describe two of these wonderful charts that I've got to share with you today, let me remind you that if now, in Astrology 101, I went over the charts of some well-known people, and one of them was Taylor Swift. Well, I'm going to pick up where I left off with Taylor Swift's chart because she is at the top of the charts uh, musically right now, and everybody knows who she is. So, Taylor Swift, as you may remember when I did this, is a Sagittarian. And when we do a forecast, uh, we have degrees that the planets are in, degrees in minutes. I'm not putting the degrees in minutes up here because I don't want to complicate things uh, for you. However, with a 12th house sun, let me just go over her birth chart just for a second. With a 12th house sun, she is a very private person. Now you might say, everybody knows who she is. That's true, but she is a private person and she doesn't like her private time given away. I've got to share something here as well. Do you remember what we talked about the planet Uranus in the birth chart? Well, even in a forecast, that's the rebel. And when her mother spoke recently at the Country Music Awards, she talked about the fact that uh, Taylor was always rebellious when it came to the boys in her life. Well, there is Uranus, the planet of rebellion, in Taylor Swift's 12th house. Now, she has a Capricorn ascendant. Capricorn is very practical, very logical, very traditional. I always say if you have Capricorn strongly in your chart, if you are a Capricorn or you have a Capricorn ascendant or moon, you don't mope, you don't hope you cope and you climb to the top slowly but surely. Okay, so that's what Taylor Swift has been doing. So here she is rebelling behind the scenes, loving her life behind the scenes. Um, her Uranus is in Capricorn. I'm going to share some of her other planets so that you get the picture before I actually go into her forecast for you. She has Mercury in her first house. Well, Mercury is what we think about and talk about, and so she thinks about herself and she talks about herself. And there's nothing wrong with that. It just is. So this is the lifetime in which she wanted to put more attention on herself as far as thinking and talking and all of that good stuff. Now, she has Neptune the dreamer, the idealist. Yeah, a little spacey maybe, but Neptune hears a distant melody in her first house. And so people with Neptune in their first house love costumes, they love make-believe. And so the drama, the romance of the theater is very strong with her. Um, and every time I see her on TV, she's dancing. So <clears throat> to me, that fits. Now, what's so interesting also is that she has the planet Saturn in her first house. Saturn is the planet of responsibility. Respond to your ability. It triggers an old head on young shoulders. And so with a Capricorn ascendant, Mercury in Capricorn, Neptune in Capricorn, Saturn in Capricorn, we are talking about somebody who is very hardworking and takes herself very seriously and puts herself first. And you might say, well, I thought she was very generous. She is very generous, but the chart shows what's really going on. In addition, let me just add some of these other things. She has Venus in her first house. When you have, wherever Venus is, that's what you love. That's what you think is beautiful. So in her first house, she is going to feel beautiful. And isn't she? When you think you're beautiful, you are, and she really is beautiful. So that fits perfectly. I've seen many charts with Venus in the first house. The person loves themselves. If we all loved ourselves, we would not war. Because when you love you, everybody loves you. And everybody loves Taylor Swift. Okay, she also has her North Node in that first house, but I'm not gonna include that right now because what I'm gonna do is show you 
how we're going to forecast her chart. All right. The planet Saturn, and as you know, we have finished all the planets as they go round and round in the zodiac. Saturn is going to sit on her sun in 2016 and 2017. Now, let me tell you what this does. The sun is the giver of life. It's the center of our life. It is our ego. It's who we are. Her sun is in her 12th house. Saturn makes it tangible. And so when Saturn sits on your sun, you grow up. You say, this is what I have to do. Uh, it doesn't make you ego-centered. It simply means that you get very clear about yourself. You can take charge of your life at that point, and you want to take charge of your life. And so after Saturn sits on her sun in 2016 and 17, in another 30 years, it's going, 29, 30, it's going to sit on her sun one more time. And this will be her taking stock of her life and starting again which is wonderful, but you won't see this necessarily because the sun is hidden in the 12th house. But this is the good news that's very exciting. Saturn, over the next couple of years, is going to be crossing her ascendant. It's going to be sitting on that Uranus in her 12th house. Now, Uranus in your 12th house is the rebel. Saturn says, whoa, slow it down. Just, it's, it's her hitting the brake with one foot and the accelerator with the other. Uranus says, let me loose. Let me do my thing my way. Saturn says, let's get hold of ourselves, girl. Okay, when Saturn crosses your ascendant, that is when you truly take charge of your life. And it is a, uh, a, a huge growing up period. Saturn will come back to the ascendant every 29 to 30 years. So this is her first Saturn on her sun and her first Saturn on her ascendant. How interesting is that? So she's, she's going to be growing up over the next couple of years. But the big news that uh, I think you'll really, those of you who follow her will be appreciative of this. The planet Pluto has been sitting in her first house for several years. It's been in Capricorn. When Pluto crossed her ascendant, she was transformed. It was a whole new her. Do you remember when she was just a country music star? And now she's crossover. Well, I don't know exactly when that happened, but I can tell you that Pluto was in her first house. This is the total transformation, total remake of yourself. And that's exactly what happened. So for the past, oh, I want to say five, six years, I don't have the Ephemeris, which is the book that lists all the planets for a given period of time, but uh, let's just say at least five years. Pluto has been s crossing into her first house and sitting on her ascendant, on her Mercury, total change in her thinking, Neptune, total change in her dream. And now, in t this year, 2015 and 2016, it's sitting on her Saturn. Saturn in the first house makes you very serious, very practical, very grown up. And Pluto is going to say, I got to bust loose. It's all or nothing with Pluto. So there it is uh, in her first house. And you might say, well, Wait a minute, what happened to her 10th house? Oh, let me show you what she has natally in her 10th house. This is fascinating. She has Pluto, the planet of total transformation, in her 10th house, in its own sign, Scorpio. Wherever Pluto is, is where you must have control. And so she has to have control. Now, I want to tell you, since her mother is her agent, What's so interesting is she has the moon in her sixth house. The, sick, uh, the moon is the, where your mother tells you to look for your emotional security. But the sixth house is also the house of your employees. Her mother works for her. Isn't that just classic? Now, Pluto is also the roving delegate for mother. And so mother has the control. The beauty in her chart is that they are in harmonious signs. And so there is Taylor Swift. Um, looking at her career from the standpoint of transforming it and being in 
command, no matter what she does, she has to be in control of it. And as her Pluto is triggered, she'll do more and more of that. And she certainly has transformed before our eyes. Now I want to talk to you about her eclipse patterns um, before we take our break. She has eclipses that are really incredible. There, she has, uh, she's had one in her ninth house this year so far. And remember, uh, these eclipses last until the next pair come along. So this past year, it's ninth house and third house, which have been strongest. She has, let's do eclipse. She's doing a lot of communicating. This means a lot of uh, writing, a lot of composing. Uh, as a songwriter, she is so prolific. So what we're going to be seeing here is more third and ninth house emphasis, and then over the next couple of years, more second house emphasis on money and values, and eighth house, other people's money. So there can be changes that she makes in um, her money that she shares with other people, her royalties, the, the people she pays. Uh, so don't you think this is fascinating to have Pluto crossing her ascendant uh, a few years ago and still sitting in her first house, bringing about total transformation of herself? Just keep watching because the way the trend is going, she's going to be in a constant state of transformation while Pluto is in her first house, which it will be for several years. And with Pluto natally in Scorpio, when she changes things in her career, it is truly all or nothing. Now, I have not gone into the whole chart. I just wanted to share with you some of the powerful points that you can expect in one of our favorite singers nowadays. She really is on top of, of the charts. After our break, I'm going to share my favorite singer with you. It is Sir Paul McCartney. So join me after the break. Um, and once again, send me your questions. You can get to me at MaxineTaylor.com. See you in just a few minutes. Hey everybody, this is Maxine Taylor and I'm back with my, the chart of my favorite singer, Paul McCartney, Sir Paul McCartney. Um, he is a legend in his own time. He's loved by all generations and his style has uh, evolved over the years. And I'm going to go into his birth chart a little bit because this is what I do. Even if I do a forecast on someone, I like to look at the birth chart because what's hap what happens in a birth chart is that what, is tri what you have in your birth chart is triggered by the planets going round and round. So this is a very beautiful chart. First of all, um, let me go into it with you. The sun is down here in his fourth house, which is the center of his life, and so his home and family is incredibly important to him. And we know that if we know his history. Uh, he's very close to his daughter. His, uh, his first wife, Linda, was the center of his life. And so family is very important to him. Uh, he has Jupiter also in the fourth house, and they are conjunct. They are next to each other. He is a Gemini, of course. I probably should have put the signs in here, but it confuses things. We, he is born, for those of you who want his birth data, June 18th, 1942, at 2 a.m. in Liverpool, England. And so with a Sun-Jupiter conjunction, he's very jovial, he's very affable, he's very optimistic, he's very positive, and his home and family, vitally important to him, they are his haven. Now, let's jump over here to his sixth house. This is a very interesting house. Paul is a worker. He gets down to business. His moon is in Leo. Now, the moon, as we know, is where our mother tells us to look for our emotional security. And so he, he's emotionally attracted. He's knee-jerk attracted to work. He's got to be busy all the time. And that's probably why he's such a success, because he's always working. He's always busy. And with Leo, the moon in Leo, it's a very dramatic, very creative placement for the moon. It's next to Pluto. 
Now, Pluto, remember, is also a surrogate mother or grandmother. So the mother influence, the maternal influence, is seen very strongly in his sixth house of work and health and service. Pluto there, as we know, wants to be in control at work. Well, you know, when he was in the Beatles, with the Beatles, they had, as groups often do, uh, a problem by the end of their time together. And it was probably a power issue uh, because that was when Yoko came on the scene and the band ended shortly thereafter. I don't remember the exact dates, but I do know that my favorite band was breaking up. Okay, he has to be in control in his work. Now, he may, at his point in life, transform that Pluto so that it's no longer control, but it is transformation. And so his work is always going to be changing, which is wonderful. But he's got Mars there in Leo. And Mars in Leo is the king. Wherever Mars is in your chart, that's what you throw yourself into. That's what comes first to you. So you can see that he is a worker. Now, you might say, why doesn't he have anything in his 10th house of career? He's world renowned. What his chart says, obviously, is that you don't have to have anything in your 10th house to be a huge success, to be known and loved by the world. Very interesting. So hold that thought. Okay, so we know we've got this packed sixth house of work. His north node is in his sixth house, and this is the area, wherever your north node is, that's the area of your greatest success in this lifetime. So you can see that being busy and cranking out these amazing uh, tunes is what his life is about. His home and family, his haven. Okay, he has Neptune and my handwriting, I apologize again, the vertex in his seventh house. Neptune is our dreamer. Neptune in the seventh house says that everybody sees you differently, but that you create an aura about you that people love. Neptune rules his ascendant, which is Pisces, and so the energy comes from the ascendant and goes to the seventh house, and so he spins a web of um, gossamer and romance uh, with the public. Just notice how people still, of all ages, respond to him when he performs. He creates magic, and Neptune is very magical. The vertex, and I haven't spoken about this at great length, but I want to say that the vertex is your karmic role in life with other people. His dream is partnership, and his seventh house is his first spouse, and so his dream was fulfilled with his first marriage. The vertex there says that your, his role in life is to be one-on-one -on -one with a partner. He loves the one-on-one, -on -one. Um, and he loves people he can work with, of course, but his dream, his ideal, is to be married, to be involved in a partnership. And he has been in several of them. Okay, I think he's been married three times. Now, let's jump over to the 12th house. And there is the south node. The south node is that area that we have mastered in past lives. And as a result, um, it's, it's something instinctive to us. The 12th house is behind the scenes activities. And so when he um, disappears, maybe to his place in the country, fourth house, or just needs time alone, he can get lost in that. And the only problem we have with the South Node is um, it, if you spend too much time where the South Node is, it can drain you. So he's going to work and pull back and retreat, uh, fill back up with energy, go back to work, that type of thing. Now let's look at his beautiful second house. He has Venus, the planet of love and beauty. It's the lesser benefic. Um, it brings gifts. It brings love. It brings money. It's in the second house of money. <laughs> the kid's not hurting, right? It's in the sign of Taurus, which is tenacious of what it has um, and can create more and more and more. And so he loves things. Now Uranus is also in that second house. It's hidden behind the third house. And so Uranus is saying, 
uh, be unique in what you do and the way you earn your money. Be different. Be uh, creative. Be uh, your own person. And so that's exactly what he does. Now, because it's on the hidden side of the third house, look at the kind of music he creates. He's a master of several instruments and several styles. When we look at his third house, very, very interesting. He has Saturn in his third house. Now, he, his karmic group has Uranus conjunct Saturn. This is the group of people born during World War II. And when uh, you can tell your karmic group by the heavy planets, all karmic groups have the same heavy planets. When I say heavy, I mean the slow moving ones. And that's why those groups are working through the same cosmic principles or maybe just mundane principles. It's not, uh, we're attracted to people in our karmic group and we have an affinity with them. And it's not simply because we all like the same music, but it's because we, we have the heavy planets in the same pl uh, signs and we're learning the same lessons. And so for Paul McCartney, he has Uranus next to Saturn. Uranus busting loose. Saturn, no, oh, do it traditionally. And so he is a combination of traditional and non-traditional. And this is why when he's on the air, you'll hear him saying things sometimes that are a little off the wall because he is that combination of the two. And everybody in his karmic group has this. He is learning it in the area of communication, which would be the songs that he writes, the music he creates, etc. Saturn in the third house also says he has an old head on young shoulders. And he will speak very traditionally, and then that Uranus will kick in and he'll say something off the wall and funny. Just watch. Then Mercury is in Gemini as well, in its own house, uh, the third house. And so he is definitely a communicator. Now, Gemini doesn't look their age and they do not act their age. And so this is why he has that eternally youthful look about him and that eternally youthful attitude. With third house planets, especially Mercury, he gets bored easily. And you might say, well, isn't that true of a Gemini? Yes, it is. But it's even more so when you've got Mercury in your third house. Now, that's a very quick overview of Paul McCartney's birth chart. Now, I'm going to show you some of the uh, big aspects that are being triggered over the next couple of years. The first one I saw that is so exciting to me, I can't tell you. Saturn now is right about here in his eighth house. It is moving upward over the next couple of years. And in 2017, it is going to be at the very top of his chart. When you have Saturn at the top of your chart, you are at the top of your game. And you might say, well, he's achieved so much. What's he possibly going to do now? I don't know. But whatever it is, he will be at the top of his game, at the peak. So... While it's in his eighth house, we won't see a lot of this power. When it moves into his ninth house, which it will uh, over the next year, he's going to get his philosophy very clearly defined. Now, he um, is in his 70s, which means that he's able to stand back and see things even more clearly than he did when he was younger. But with Saturn in the ninth house, you really get clear on it. And when it's on his midheaven, when it's at the top of the chart in 2017, he will be at the top. What is also going on is Neptune. Remember, Neptune is a once-in-a-lifetime planet. It is approaching his, it has been, on his south node. And so he's wanted solitude and privacy. It's been his escape. When it sits on his ascendant, which it will in 2017, once again, when he's at the top of his game, the old Paul is just going to melt, dissolve. And he can put one of his dreams into operation. I know he's very, very philanthropical. Um, very philanthropic, and I think that with Saturn up there, if he wanted to start a new uh, organization, one that was spiritually motivated and humanitarian, he would be able to do that. So um, he's going to be on the horizon for a long time. 
Now, the eclipses that he's experiencing now are in the first house and the seventh house. This deals with him doing his thing and his wife doing her thing or his business partners doing their things. He may be in negotiations for something very big that he's planning that we will hear about in 2017. So um, you can see that you can look ahead at anybody's chart, including your own, and see what's going on and what to shoot for. If Paul McCartney were to sit down with me, I would say, Paul, shoot for 2017, plan now. He probably has his own astrologer. He doesn't need me, but um, I would be telling him that, and I would tell him to put his dream into action over the next couple of years. So, I hope you have enjoyed my Astrology 201 series. I hope that uh, if you have any questions, that you'll feel free to contact me at MaxineTaylor.com. You too can be very good at astrology. You can use it to help yourself grow and learn about you and to see when you should zig and when you should zag. So, if you'd like your own chart, contact me, send me your birth data, your month, day, and year, your city, and the time of birth, and I will shoot you out a copy of your birth chart and forecast. So, I hope that the stars shine brightly on you and yours, and that you enjoy looking at your own chart as well as other people.